Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. You need to see yourself as a steward, not an owner of the money that you have. Once you understand that it isn't your money, it's His money, and then He just blesses us, and our finances improved. God really blessed our finances. You can trust God with your money. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of The Gospel Truth. This is my last week of teaching on financial stewardship. This is my sixth week, and this will be the end of this teaching on this coming Friday. And I'm giving this book away as my gift to you. We also have CDs and DVDs. You can get any one of these as a free gift to you. We also have a package deal here where we have a study guide. We have another DVD that shows testimonies of people who have applied this truth and how it's affected their life. And so this coming Friday will be my last day to offer any of these materials. This week, I'm just beginning to start really talking about the benefit of giving and how you can give your way out of poverty. It doesn't make sense in the natural, and that's exactly the reason that God set it up this way. It isn't natural. It's supernatural. When you start believing God and honoring His Word, and just trusting what He said, then it starts a supernatural flow of finances towards you. And if you are in a bad spot financially, uh, you need to become a rabid, committed, uh, faithful giver. And I guarantee you that is a part of you getting out of your poverty. Let me share these verses out of Matthew chapter 6. I've referred to this a number of times during this series, but I hadn't just taught from it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is there will your heart be also. Boy, there's a lot in those three verses that I just read. Real quickly, let me just say that this is saying that you need to get an eternal perspective on your giving. Most people don't think this way. They think that money is just for this life. And to a degree, that's true. There isn't going to be money in heaven. I saw a little cartoon one time where a guy had two suitcases that were full of, you know, gold and things, and he was trying to drag them into heaven with him, and the angel says, what do you have in there? And he says, oh, this is all my gold that I had. And the angel opens up and looks at it, and he says, why did you bring pavement up here? Because the Bible says in the book of Revelation that he paves his streets with clear, transparent gold. Did you know you aren't going to be able to use gold in heaven? They use it for pavement. Money is just for this life, but you can take something that is temporary and turn it into something eternal. Now that is huge. I don't know if you got what I said, but money is temporary. It doesn't matter if it's gold, if it's silver, if it's some kind of a stone. Did you know someday the Bible says over in the book of First Peter that this uh, earth will pass away with a fervent heat and all of these things will be gone. It doesn't matter if it's diamonds, if it's gold, silver, if it's steel in your buildings. Everything physical is going to someday pass away and God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. So any assets that you have, paper, money, hard cash, uh, gold, rubies, diamonds, anything that is natural is someday going to be gone. But did you know what you can do? You can take these things that are only temporary and when you give and use your money to change a person's life, it turns into something that will never pass away. It turns into a changed life. And I, you know, when I started this teaching, I used Luke chapter 16, and Jesus there said, use money to touch people's lives so that when you die, they'll receive you into eternal habitations. And Jesus there said that you, by you giving and helping a person, someday in heaven, these people will be coming by your mansion and thanking you for what you've invested in their life. So this is a saying, I think I used this in the beginning of this teaching, but a person is not a fool to take something that he can't keep that is someday going to be gone 
and turn it into something that he can't lose. Take something that is temporary and turn it into something eternal, a changed life. That's what this is saying. You can you can't take money with you to heaven, but you can lay it up in heaven. You can send money ahead of you, and it won't be there in physical currency, but it'll be there in changed lives. And then it says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, most people would think that where your heart is, there will your treasure be. And I believe that that's a true statement. I could, I, if I came and looked at your giving, I could tell you where your heart, or let me rephrase that. It doesn't even have to be your giving. Let me just see where you spend your money. And I can tell you what your heart is. There's some of you that, you know, you're into race cars or racing and things like this, and I could see how you spend your money and where you go and what you do. And I could, I could tell just by what you're spending your money on that that's your deal. Or some of you are into sports, football or something, or others are into equestrian things and riding horses. Some of you are into clothes and jewelry. Some of you are into movies and games. And, and I could just look at what you spend your money on, and I can tell you where your heart is. So it is true that wherever your heart is, your money follows that, but it's also true, Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Did you know you can actually move your heart towards something by investing in it? You know, if you were here with me right now, and if I took your wallet, and if we were in a room together, and I took your wallet, and then I walked out the door and left, did you know your heart would go with me? You would be wondering, what is Andrew going to do with my wallet? What, where is he going? What's he going to spend? What's he, why did he want my wallet? Wherever your treasure is, your heart follows that. So you can use your giving to direct your heart towards God. You can actually start investing in the kingdom of God, and it will move your heart that direction. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And look at this in verse 22. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? You know, I believe that this is actually talking about your focus. It's just saying whatever you focus on is what you're going to be full of. If you are focused on just things of this world, when it comes time for you to receive and you, you turn on what you filled yourself with, out's going to come this stuff and it's not going to benefit you. This is saying that you need to be single. Your focus needs to be single on the Lord. And the context of this, verses 19 and on down all the way to verse 33, is talking about money and the things that you have need of that money provides. And so in context, this is talking about that your focus of your money, it needs to be on the kingdom of God and not on yourself. You need to be single on that. And I know somebody's thinking, if I did that, well, then how am I going to survive? Who's going to take care of me if I'm just focused on the things of God? God would. The Lord would take care of you, and He would take care of you better than you would ever take care of yourself. And I know that some of you think, man, nobody would take care of me. If I, if I used my finances and just gave off of everything and tithe and gave offerings, and if I put first the kingdom of God, I'd be less off, uh, less better off than I am now. And that's true if there wasn't a God who said, when you give, it'll be given. And if you go on down to verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God, talking about in context with your money, Put your money first into the kingdom of God. Use that to focus your heart on the things of God. And then all of these other things will be added unto you. And the other things that he was talking about was what, where you eat, what you eat, what, where you sleep, and what you're clothed with. In other words, if you would put God first and his kingdom first, then God will supernaturally build your kingdom. He will take care of you. And God is El Shaddai, not El Chipo. He won't shortchange you. You won't have to be living in a rented house and just barely getting by. God will take care of you better than you would take care of yourself. So your eye needs to be single. Your focus needs to be that, God, I am a steward, 
and I am going to take this money that you've given me, the resources that you've given me, my talents and abilities, everything that you've given me that can be turned into money, and I am going to use it to glorify you first and foremost. That's being single. And then the next verse says, but if thine eye be evil, it's making a contrast. And what it's saying is anything that's not single on God being first is evil. That's quite a statement. And again, did you know that the average Christian would not agree with this? The average Christian would think, look, I've got to take care of myself first, and then I'll give to God left over. The average person thinks, no, I can't just trust God to prosper me. I've got to do it all on my own. Well, there is a, there is a balance here. It's not you just sitting back and twiddling your thumbs and waiting on God to just drop money out of heaven. He doesn't do that. It says over in Deuteronomy 8, 18, that God gives us power to get wealth. He doesn't give you wealth directly. He gives you the power to get wealth. And so you've got to go put your hand to something. You've got to work. You've got to do something. But it's God who has given you that power. And God is the one who will give you the connections, the abilities. He will prosper you. You've got to stay focused on Him, even though you are working and doing things. You've got to be single-minded upon God. And then in that next verse, it says, if thine eye be evil, saying that anything that's not single-minded is evil. And again, this is just contrary to most people. No, I've got to be double-minded. I've, I've got to seek God some, but then I've got to also seek my kingdom. No, you can put first the kingdom of God, and God will take care of your kingdom. Let me share this verse with you out of Proverbs chapter 28. And in verse 22, it says, He that hasteneth to be rich hath an evil eye, and considereth not that poverty shall come upon him. Man, there's a lot in that verse. But if you hasten, if you are anxious, if you are eager, if you are seeking after money and riches, the Bible says that you have an evil eye, and that's going to bring you to poverty. So this says that if you are double-minded or if you are uh, having double vision, that that is an evil eye. Did you know that you just need to get to where you cast your care about prosperity over on the Lord and you say, God, I'm going to take everything I've got and everything I'm ever going to have, and I'm putting you first. I'm seeking first the kingdom of God, and that's my whole focus. Now, it's up to you to help provide for my needs. And again, he'll do it through you working, but you won't have to work two and three and four jobs to be able to you know, to survive and get by. God will bless your efforts so that He can multiply them and you don't have to spend every waking hour just at the grindstone trying to get through. I know the things that I'm saying sound radical to a lot of people. This is not most people's experience, but this is what these scriptures are saying. And then look at this next verse. It says, No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is just an old English way of referring to money, or a friend of mine, Creflo Dollar, says that this is actually talking about the demonic power that of covetousness that works through money. But in other words, you just can't serve God and money. You can't be a slave to money. You need to serve God. You know, I just ordained a couple to the ministry just a couple of days ago, and one of the prophecies that came over them was that you are never going to have to evaluate what God's will for you is based on how much money you have. You can just literally set the money issue aside and just deal with God. What is your will? And whatever God tells you, you just go do it, that there will be plenty of money for you to accomplish God's will. That's something that God spoke into my life decades ago. And you know, this is exactly the way I function right now. When we built these buildings that we built for our Karis Bible College, we were probably a year and a half into the process, and we actually had finalized the plans, and we were sitting down with the builder before I ever asked him, what is this going to cost? I didn't consider the cost. Now, I'm not saying that I was irresponsible, uh, as we discussed some things, I wanted this large expanse down in the basement, and I didn't want any kind of a dividing wall or anything. And they said, it'll cost you an extra million and a half dollars to get a big enough steel beam 
to support all this week and make that happen. And they said, if you just allow us to put one center post in there, we can save you a million and a half dollars. So you know what? I said, okay, we'll have a post. I'm not saying I ignored finances, but I didn't let finances dictate to me. I did what I felt that God wanted me to do. And I don't think in terms of how much is this is going to cost. I think in terms of what does God want me to do? And that's what this is saying, that you can't serve God and mammon. That you can't serve two masters. You just have to come under the Lord. God, you're my source. What do you want me to do? And then if he tells you to do something, he's going to provide a way for you to get the finances that you need. But you need to be single, not have an evil eye, not double vision. And then it goes on and it talks all the way, rest of the way down to verse 33. It starts using examples about how that we can't control certain things. You can't make yourself grow. You can't, you, you aren't the ones that made the lilies of the field. Look at some of these things. In verse 25, it says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or for your body what ye shall put on? Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Now, did you know at first glance, you look at this and think, this can't be, you can't live this way. You have to think about what you're going to eat. You know, especially if you were the one preparing the food, you have to go buy the food. You have to give some thought to it. This isn't saying that you take no thought. It's matter of fact, I think it's the Amplified Bible that says, take no anxious thought. This isn't saying that you don't plan your meals. It's not saying that you don't think about your bedding and that you don't think about uh, your house and, you know, what color you want it and what size you need for your family. This is talking about that you don't worry about it. It's not your responsibility. What this is talking about is, is when you get to where you live to give and you are putting first the kingdom of God, when you see yourself as a steward and not an owner of the resources, then you can get to a place to where you, you take the thought that is necessary to be able to do things, but you don't take any anxious thoughts. You don't have the burden. It's not your responsibility. Get everything done. Man, this is huge. Did you know right now, if you were to include all of our offices worldwide, I think we have either 14 or 16 offices worldwide. And if you were to take the whole thing, did you know I have to have something like eight thousand dollars an hour every hour of every day 24 hours a day seven days a week 364 days out of the year or 65 days out of the year i have to have eight thousand dollars an hour did you know i could take thought if i felt like i had to produce this on my own i guarantee you i could crum crumble under the weight of that but because I've learned these principles and I'm seeking first the kingdom of God, did you know God is taking care of this? God speaks to people. God has people come and give us money. And we give all of these materials away. I'm giving away. We will give away tens of thousands of these books. And if I'm not mistaken, I don't think this one has a price on it, but usually it's around 15, 14 or 15 bucks for a book and you give away a thousand of those, that right there would be 15,000 and you give away 10,000 of them, that's $150,000. And then all of these DVDs and CDs, did you know what? I just give and I put first God's kingdom. I'm putting these truths out to people and I can promise you that we'll wind up getting all of the money that we need for these materials. It'll come back to us. This is the way I live. I know some of you think you can't live that way. Don't wake me up. This is how I'm living. I just don't take anxious thoughts about it. In verse 26, it says, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet their heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Man, did you see that newspaper article about that there were 10 million birds that just wound up dead, that they starved to death? Did you see that? No, and you never will because God takes care for birds. There are millions and probably billions of birds, and yet God takes care of them. If God takes care of birds, what makes you think He wouldn't take care of you? It goes on to say in verse 27, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? 
we could just say, how, how many of you, by thinking about it, can make yourself one inch taller? If you can't do that thing which is least, you can't do that which is greatest. Why are you... You know, God just causes you to grow. Every one of us are the exact perfect height. Both of your feet reach the ground. That's perfect. God took care of that. God will take care of your finances. Verse 28, And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon and all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. You know, the Bible says that Solomon was the richest man that has or ever will live. He was so rich that during his days, they took silver and just throw it, threw it on the ground like a rock. Nobody even paid attention to silver because gold was so plentiful. And yet Solomon wasn't as beautiful as one little lily that just lasts for a week or two. God created that. If God takes care of the lilies, how much more will He take care of you? It says in verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more shall He clothe you, O ye of little faith? If you're struggling with this and saying, man, can I really turn my finances over? Can I just start giving off of everything I get and put first the kingdom of God and trust Him to take care of my needs? If I take care of His needs, if I give to His kingdom, will He take care of my kingdom? If you're struggling with that, the Bible here says you are of little faith. And going back to the very first thing I taught when I got into this series, trusting God in the area of finances is the least use of your faith. If you can't do that which is least, you can't do that which is greatest. I'm telling you, this isn't an option. If you want to see God's prosperity come in your life, you need to start learning how to give. You need to start being a giver. It says, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be closed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. This is saying that you shouldn't take any anxious thoughts. You shouldn't worry about it. And I'm going to take a little bit of liberty here, but this is a great truth that the way you take a thought is when you say it. Take no thought, saying. I think it was Kenneth Hagin that said, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep it from landing in your hair and making a nest. You can't keep random thoughts from coming. We live in a world where there's just evil and there's ungodliness and unbelief spoken. Unbelief will come to you, but when, when you speak it is when you take it. If you don't speak it, you don't take it. Take no thought saying, because in verse 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all of these things, what you eat, where you sleep, what you're clothed with, all these things will be added unto you if you will put God's kingdom first. There's some of you watching this program that you love God, God loves you, but you have not put His kingdom first in your finances. God is speaking to you today that you need to do it. You need to start trusting God, honoring God in this area, and it will change your life. This is my gift to you. This book or the DVD or the CD set here is my gift to you. If you'll listen, our announcer is going to give you some information about how you can get that. Remember that this coming Friday is going to be the last day for me to offer this and make it available over our television program. So please listen and then call or write today. Andrew is offering his complete teaching on financial stewardship in your choice of either a book CD album or DVD album as his free gift to you today. Go to awmi.net to order your free product today. This offer is limited to one free product per household and is only available in the US, UK, Canada, and Australia. This teaching is also available as a companion study guide for a gift of any amount when you contact us or you can get these valuable resources in the Financial Stewardship Package. This package includes the Financial Stewardship Book, Study Guide, and your choice of either the CD or DVD album, as well as the Financial Breakthroughs DVD. This DVD includes six testimonies of people that experience the freedom of turning their finances over to God. This package has a catalog value of $115, 
but you can get it today for only $80. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. Go to awmi.net to see all the ways you can get these products. Or you can call our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, Monday through Friday, and from 7.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Saturday and Sunday. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. Welcome to the AWM Minute, a small glimpse on how the friends and partners of Andrew Womack Ministries are saving lives around the world. Lives like Scott Peterson. When a horrific car accident put Scott in the trauma unit, he was unconscious, on life support, and expected to lose one of his legs. While the doctors prognosed a very small chance of survival, his wife Diane stood her ground that by the stripes of Jesus, her husband was healed. I had to tap into what God's Word said. So I just opened up to Psalm 91. With long life, I will satisfy Him and show Him my salvation. That came alive to me. I felt that the Lord spoke to me. He's going to be okay. To the surprise of the entire medical staff, Scott made a miraculous recovery, and in a matter of weeks, he walked out of the hospital on his own two feet. To see Scott's full healing journey, visit awmi.net today. You know, throughout this entire series, we've been talking about giving and specifically partnership, and we need partners. I'm believing God for 10,000 new partners. We've already got over $120 million worth of buildings in just the last nine years, but I've got at least $100 million worth, maybe $200 million worth of buildings still in my heart for our students, for an activity center. We've got a new student housing that we've got a preliminary drawing of that is showing you a little idea of what it would look like. This one would house about 120 people. Our others are gonna be smaller with maybe somewhere around 40 people per dorm, but we need this student housing and we need people to become partners. I'm believing for 10,000 new partners, I would ask you to pray about it. And if the Lord says so, join with us and help us change people's lives through Karis Bible College. So I started doing Karis Bible College online while I was living in Mexico as a missionary. And it was just so amazing being able to do it at home you know, with young children. We live in a very remote area. My husband and I would um, download the classes into our phones. The online classes are absolutely awesome. You're getting ministered to. You're learning how to minister to other people. It is your biggest return on investment. I want to let you know that we have now started a Karis Daily Live Bible Study. We've been doing a Bible study every Tuesday night live for about two years, but now we have five days a week. We've varied the times so that we can accommodate anybody's schedule, and it's gonna really be good. We're gonna use our instructors from the school, and it'll be a blessing. So remember, we now have a Karis Daily Live Bible Study five days a week.